Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are here for another episode of Conversations with Rob. We're here in sunny South Florida, in Delray Beach, Florida, uh, a beautiful place, place that I lived for uh, five and a half years, actually probably more than that, maybe six, but regardless of the case, no one cares. Uh, we have uh, Steve West here, who is an activist, a former New York City guy. He was brought up there and he ran the streets of New York and New York City to be exact. He's been uh, accompanied by James Brown. He's worked with uh, him, Muhammad Ali, Al Sharpton, and many other famous athletes, actors, actresses, and many other famous people. He's also started many organizations now working here in uh, Riviera Beach to try to help uh, African American on African American crime. We'll talk about that as the podcast rolls on. Steve, thanks so much for uh, coming, and uh, also thank you so much for doing this. I really greatly appreciate That's it. That's my privilege. Thank you. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Growing up in New York City, what was the life like? Uh, and you said you grew up with me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. In the in the forties, correct? Well, I was uh, born in 1939, mm -hmm. so uh, I was alive and kind of. Kicking, Kicking, but not yeah. remembering too much in the 40s. Right. And uh, I uh, lived in Long Island, part of, uh, part of New York. Right. And um, grew up there in uh, in uh, in uh, Queens County first, which was New York City, mm -hmm. and then moved on to Long Island a little bit uh, when I was a teenager. Right. So how was New York City at that time in the, in the 30s, with the late 30s and the 40s? Uh, was there a lot of drugs on the street? Was there a lot of poverty uh, where you were living? What did you see growing up that you can remember? Well, it was mainly at least where I was uh, lower middle class. Mm -hmm. And uh, compared to today, everything was poverty. We didn't have computers. We, uh, right. Until I was a little older, we didn't have television sets. Sure. Uh, there were still horse and buggies on the... Uh, the Jeez. Iceman came with a horse. Uh, but uh, basically... Um, as a kid, I don't have uh, a, a, that. That wasn't a part that was uh, formative in my uh, in my life. I started really uh, getting conscious when I was a teenager. Right now, as a young adult, you are Jewish for the for the viewers. We you've seen a lot uh, for the people that historic historical people that watch the program, which is many. Uh, we we know that uh, there was Nazi Germany. We know that uh, a lot of that was happening in the forties. Did you, as a person that's Jewish, did you hear about a lot of that in being in New York? Well, again, as a child, we didn't hear too right. much about that. We were too busy playing uh, stickball stick ball, and yeah. ball. And, <laughs> right. uh, I do remember a day when uh, uh, Roosevelt died, and I had okay. to be five years old. We were in the sandbox, playing in the sandbox. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, the adults were so unhappy and disappointed, and this guy Truman yeah. was going to be the next president and he didn't know anything and it was a horrible a horrible day however uh, truman in my opinion turned out to be one of our greatest presidents and right. so what does a five-year-old know you know we have to true. learn as we go on true so when that's that's i i believe this is as a side note but for somebody that grew up like you said you were out playing stickball you were out in the sandbox they don't even have that stuff anymore for kids growing up I think that's, uh, for, like I said, a side note, that's one of the problems we have with our society is in your, your age growing up, everybody was outside, not Absolutely. inside, playing around on Xbox, playing around on computers, people outside hanging out with their friends and that, uh, we'll finish off with this, it uh, develops social skills and you learn, you know, through meeting other people at a young age. Right. Well, I, the world's a different place now and there's right. uh, pluses and minuses True. Uh, from any change. And uh, it was a time where we had a lot of fun. We look back at it. We look at the kids today and say they're missing something. Right. But then we're missing what, uh, what they have and we didn't have with the communications, the opportunity mm -hmm. that you have to learn right in the palm of your hand. Right. Uh, every kid doesn't take advantage of that, unfortunately. It's more frivolous. But the people who do right. have uh, a tool that's never been available in human history. Right. Um, so we'll move on now to growing up now. So in your 20s, I would say, in 30s, you got more involved in activism, would you say? Well, my first act of activism um, came when I was five. 
Okay. And that yeah. came, I'll just go back to that one because it was formative for me. Um, we had a lady who was my second mother. She brought us up. She was a brown lady. Right. And uh, she was, um, uh, I, I noticed that five years old that we ate our meal, uh, my sister, myself, my parents, and yeah. that uh, Joy was her name. She sat kind of uh, stood in a corner, you know, ready to maybe refill a glass or whatever. Yeah. I noticed that, uh, that there was something wrong with that in my young mind. So I spoke up to my parents and I said, I'm not eating again until Joy sits with us, unless Joy sits with us. Now, my parents for the time wow. were very, very liberal, yeah. but they never even thought of anything like that. Wow. So uh, from there on, uh, she, there were five of us at the table. Wow. And I know it stuck with me until today. When, whenever I see injustice, it bothers me. Yeah. And it becomes important that people who see injustice and are bothered by it, um, some people think about it, talk about it, but they don't move. I, I've yeah. been an active person all my life in trying to uh, bring justice where it doesn't exist. Right. So you talked about um, stuff that you've done to me, and this was off camera. Um, but talk about you. You said you um, uh, uh, made an organization uh, as far as feeding the poor or feeding people around the world. Could you talk to the viewers a little bit about that? Well, if I may, the first thing that I did um, was at uh, in my very early 20s, I had an experience mm -hmm. with trying to move into a neighborhood um, where I found out as I was signing the, uh, the uh, documents mm -hmm. that uh, black people were not allowed to live in. Okay. And I found out from there that black people couldn't live anywhere that mm -hmm. uh, they weren't wanted. It was uh, the law protected them. Mm -hmm. So I started the first fair housing group in, in the country. Wow. And that uh, idea was an idea that whose time has come because it grew very, very quickly on Long Island. We had fair housing groups all over the island. Mm -hmm. It um, started to grow and multiply to where Nassau County got the first uh, fair, uh, not fair housing, but civil rights um, uh, commissioner. Uh, we got Jackie Robinson, uh, who, who was hired by uh, Nelson Rockefeller as the first yeah. um, the commissioner for New York State, which was the first state in the union. And the whole idea of fair housing just took off. People felt the injustice. And the fair housing law that we have now, or the civil rights law that we have now, um, which uh, which uh, uh, gives anybody a right to live where they want to, uh, but it started off as a black and white issue. It started off in my, in my house. Wow. And um, I'm very proud of that because it's lasted all these years. It took six years from 1962 to 1968 from the first fair housing group uh, in progression mm -hmm. to the to the uh, Civil Rights uh, Act of 1968. So, uh, so th and that's great because we do need fair housing. I mean, we see, uh, you know, we do see discrimination against black people, brown people in general still, but we even look at poor people in general get discriminated uh, as far as getting a fair rent. I mean, rent is sky high all over the country, the rent control is zero in, in the majority of our country, especially our big cities, uh, Orlando, Miami. I mean, you're looking at rents in, in those areas of 12, 1300, somebody working at Wendy's or McDonald's can't afford those kind of rents. And it's it's really sad. And that's just, like I said, not just for black and brown people, it's for Asians, it's for white, it's mm -hmm. for anybody that, you know, that's the way the country is now, and it's yeah. sad. Well, it has been. It was very much right. uh, that way um, in the 50s and 60s. Poverty is um, is um, a tremendous blight everywhere mm -hmm. in the world. It's historically something that exists all the time. Right. However, uh, if, you, if you don't stand up to do something about it right. after you see and you feel the injustice, um, you're just uh, part of the problem. Right. So, I mean, that's how I feel about myself, which is when you see it, do something about it. So um, all the problems haven't been solved. In fact, in some ways, they're getting worse. In mm -hmm. fact, especially today when uh, things are so uh, going the other way and being reversed. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, to answer your question, 
uh, I got in the um, late 1970s and through the 80s, I was involved in world hunger. I started an organization called uh, Impact on Hunger. Mm -hmm. And that organization came from a commission that Jimmy Carter set out to, to do a, a study on is hunger necessary in the world. Mm -hmm. And the commission came back with a very clear answer. And the answer was, there's enough food to feed two to three times the population. It's not a problem of, is there enough? But it's a problem of political will. Are we going to do something to make distribution uh, fair and have no child, no person starving to death? Mm -hmm. And so our organization was educational to spread the word about what uh, Jimmy uh, Carter's commission had found out. Right. And we worked at that, and uh, that's where uh, Ali, who was our main spokesman, but we had all sorts of uh, movie stars and, and uh, TV stars and, and athletes, all sorts of celebrities uh, as spokespeople. And Ali was our outstanding, because he was the most famous person in the world at that right. time and for years after. And um, I, I worked with UNICEF. Uh, and uh, Ali became the spokesperson for the, for our organization and for UNICEF. Only he started to get that's when he started to get sick. And after three years of, of training and going around the world together and speaking to people of all kinds, leaders and common people, yeah. uh, we had to abort the the uh, project because of his uh, his um, health. Right. So uh, talking about that and uh, kind of moves on to. Your activism now, um, you, you're more active right now in the uh, the um, Riviera Beach area as far as uh, dealing with black on black crime. Uh, Riviera Beach, for uh, of the viewers, is right near Boynton Beach, uh, close to Delray and Boca Raton. Also, uh, in that area of Palm Beach County, uh, we see a lot of murders in Riviera Beach. A lot of um, you know, if you watch the ish the um, show Cops. They, they do do a lot, quite a few segments in Riviera Beach. It's a uh, troubled area. Now, you have, have talked to quite a few people there and working on a new project. Could you tell the viewers about uh, the black on black crime problem there and also your kind of ways that you think you can solve this problem or make it better? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, uh, gun violence is uh, endemic. Uh, it takes all kinds of forms. Uh, I don't have to go into explaining. Everybody knows what goes on in the schools and the movie theaters right. and, and so forth. But about uh, 250 out of uh, 250 um, inner city murders take place for every school murder that takes place, every suicide mm -hmm. takes place. It's, it's um, really endemic and it goes on every day because it's really not sexy. It's in the black community and the, mm -hmm. the reporting uh, and the interest is not uh, really there. And um, it's basically something that's overcomable. I just want to step back for a second and give one piece of background because the other thing that I spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. was international um, self-development. Sure. And I work with an organization called Salvodia in Sri Lanka. And that is not uh, as well known because in a small country, but um, in the field and in the United Nations and so forth, people consider that um, the grand, the, uh, Ari Rotten is the, is the person who started that 55 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. they, can, they call him the grandfather of development. Right. And I became, uh, we became very close friends 50 years ago and have maintained our friendship and I've worked with them and have been an advisor and uh, supporter okay. uh, for all these years. They do development in the most sensible way that I've ever seen anybody run any kind of an organization. How so? Well, first of all, they, they're they holistic. They okay. go in and they, uh, they take care of everything. It's not just food. It's not just education. It's not just housing. It's not just getting with trees and clean water. Right. They take a community that is living in the jungle and has very little contact with the outside world. And they bring all of these things and up and they bring in opportunity so people by themselves and for themselves can create a democratic society where there's no starvation, where people mm -hmm. make decisions together. Um, it's too much to go into 
yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. but it, I, I can say it's the best organization I've ever seen in my life. And I learned so much from Ari because he's done this so successfully. The reason I'm bringing this um, up in the preliminary answer to your question yeah. is because um, here in the urban communities, the poverty is a little different than it is in Sri Lanka where people have nothing. Yeah. You know, not even a pot to pee in, as they say. Yeah. But um, the poverty is really endemic. And sure. the, the problem is lack of opportunity. The right. communities are poor, individuals are poor, institutions are poor. And um, that's something that can be overcome, given the political will, which is what we worked on in the right. hunger issue. And given um, a comprehensive program that allows people to uh, to develop their own opportunities. So I've been going for the last almost two years and speaking to the leadership of the community, the clergy, the uh, office holders, the police, and there's a great head start in, it's, it's, there's two cities there, Riviera Beach and West Palm Beach. Okay. And the, 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 the groundwork is laid for a breakthrough there because those two cities have the most wonderful police departments. You hear about all this stuff about uh, police, police and yeah. black communities having all these problems. Um, there's some suspicion there from what they see on television, but on the ground uh, and, and, and uh, the efforts that uh, the police departments make in every single way, they're really part of the communities. So we've got that advantage of having police who are involved in this. We have politicians now who are committed to, we've got the clergy. So all of these places that, um, that individually are behind overcoming the mm -hmm. uh, black on black gun violence, um, they're working, people working separately, they're working um, on their own projects. And one of the things that we're trying to do is bring them all together as a community so the right. community then has the resources to make the uh, difference. Right. And we're also looking for outside help, financial help, to bring in uh, uh, the, 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 the priming the pump for yes. opportunity. Right. Um, so with that, and we'll, and we'll do, we will touch on a little bit with that. Um, you, you touched on the um, police and the black community. Uh, as you said, we see uh, every uh, day, or, mo or at least once a week, a week uh, so a black man we just seen uh, got killed inside of his own house. The woman was a white police officer in Dallas, Texas. She walked in on the wrong floor, looked into the wrong, went into the wrong apartment. The apartment had a different rug than hers. She went and she shot the guy straight on in. And she gets nine, not, uh, 10 years in prison, good behavior. She probably gets out in five or six years. Meanwhile, there's somebody that's dead that was actually a good citizen to the community. He was in the clergy, and, and he was a good citizen, uh, talked by most of the people in the community. Um, what, what do you say to a lot of these people that you're talking to that are black, that are you know, in these communities where they do not get this funding, and they, you say, you know, the police is good, but... To, like I said, to push back a little bit, we just had that incident recently. The, every day uh, we've seen Trayvon Martin. We, I know uh, Zimmerman wasn't a police, real policeman, but mm -hmm. uh, similar to that in Neighborhood Watch. Uh, we have tons of issues with the police and black people getting shot, getting, you know, um, somebody, they're driving around, they just go up to the car. It's a black person, they give them a tough time. So how do you get the, them to trust each other, even if it's a good department, like you said? Well, first of all, um, you're, you've loaded my head with thoughts here. Sorry. <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, Cain and Abel had a little murder problem between them. True, yes. And I would say back to the uh, cavemen, we've had uh, a murder, and we're not going to stop murder. Right. But what we feel can happen is that we can... We can um, give people the incentive to change the culture. Right. The, sorry, Steve. Let me just interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's uh, to get to my point, and I, I don't know if this is the, the way it made out. Is that 
most of the people that are getting picked on by the police are black or Hispanic, more so than somebody that's white or rich. That's what I was kind of getting across. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, prejudice has been around since True, people yes. in the caves. I mean, we're set up. Uh, as human beings to defend ourselves and to look out for ourselves and our families. And, yeah. you know, when another tribe of cavemen was coming over the hill, um, you would do everything you could to uh, uh, repel them. Right, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, religion came along and said, well, welcome them. Right. And, you know, that works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. Yeah. There's no one answer is the, is the bottom line. True. And there's no elimination. But there is changing the circumstances. And one thing I learned from Ari is that we don't change other people's circumstances. We can only change within ourselves yeah. and set an example for other people. But people can, when they, when they have the opportunity to develop uh, different attitudes, people can start to, um, uh, to upgrade their own homes, upgrade their own community, and it's catching because as we've seen in the jungles of Sri Lanka, when people who have nothing, even any expectations, and they wait for the government who comes every 10 years and says, we're going to help you out. And then 10 years mm -hmm. later, they say the same thing. Uh, what, we're try what I'm trying to do here is to get through the leadership, to get the word out to the community, mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, change the culture. The, the main problem in some of these communities, many of these communities is the drug, uh, uh, the drug trade. Yes. When there's no, when there's just poverty and the only people that a young person can see who are doing well is the person who's drug selling drug. drugs. Yeah. So what we want to do is um, get that out of the communities. You know, here in Palm Beach, we've got a lot of white communities. We have a few black communities. The white communities don't stand for um, the drug trade going on on the streets. In fact, it's not easy to get these drugs in a white community where it is easy in the, uh, in the uh, uh, black communities, Hispanic communities, because that's just part of the culture. People have, it's, the, it's, it's a basic part of the economy. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen there, when I talk about opportunity, I'm talking about uh, lots, lots of opportunity, like educational opportunity, right. but particularly in this case, financial opportunity. Right. So these, these kids have to have something to look forward to where they can have a good job, a computer job, where they can be trained, where they can be, um, uh, have jobs available. And that's kind of the bottom line of what we're working towards. Right. We see the problem. We know that there are answers and it's a long, hard road to get, uh, a mindset of a community change, right. but I know from personal experience, it works and it works beautifully and things do not only change, but transform. Yeah. And you just stated this, the only way you get rid of the uh, uh, drug uh, trade is to get the opportunity, like you said, it's jobs, but then you got the state of Florida and this is where you run into the problem for you guys. You got the state of Florida where it's a Republican uh, legislator, a Republican governor. They don't want to invest in these communities. They're not investing uh, jo jobs in Riviera Beach. They're not mm -hmm. investing uh, money in the schools. Yeah, there. nor did the Democrats, because this well, is going on generation been after power, generation though, after since, generation. Yeah. It's not the last party. The thing is, yeah. it's a mindset change. It's a mindset change for all of us. When we see black and white, yeah. And that makes a difference. I mean, I have less melanin in my skin than somebody who we call black or brown. Yeah. Because it's just a chemical in the skin. Yeah. It, it, Martin Luther King said it the best. Uh, judge a man by his, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, right, yeah. but judge a man by his or her character, uh, not by the color of the skin. Right. And that, that's a goal to shoot for. And it's simply stated and it's when, when we have that and we can ignore and get past prejudice and get past this way of looking at each other and just look at each other as human beings, a whole lot is going to change in the world. Yeah. But it takes time. When I go back to the 50s when I, and the early 60s, when I started with this, 
Um, we've come such a long way, it's incredible. But if you, if you use the analogy of a boat in a river going yeah. to another shore, we're as far away from that destined shore mm -hmm. as we are from where we were when people were hanging forbidden food on the trees. Right, true. Um, and, and thank you for explaining that. Uh, I, so I, but I do agree with you as far as the opportunity aspect. I just wanted to state that. Uh, let's move on to education. You're a lifetime learner. You've been in the classroom for years upon years upon years. What do you see? Uh, you've been at the college that I was at. Uh, what do you see from the kids uh, in, in the classroom? Do you feel like these kids are the next leaders? Or do you feel like there's a few kids that are the next leaders? Or do you feel like none of the kids are, are really uh, the next leaders from being in the classroom? Well, I'm going to use this um, as, as an example of uh, overcoming prejudice. Okay. Because when you ask a question like that, you're coming from a place that has a preconceived notion. True. true. And, and life is more complicated and people are more complicated. You know, each one of us is capable of love and of hate. That's yes. how we're set up. And we make decisions as we go through life and we have opportunities to yeah. make a decision. Are you going to build? Are you going to destroy? Are you going to love? Are you going to hate? So yeah. we have the most incredible, or you have in your generation, the most incredible people. Look at these kids from Parkland. Mm -hmm. Look at these kids now uh, fighting uh, climate control. Uh, it, it's just outstanding. Kids in my generation couldn't have even thought that way. They couldn't speak that way. But you guys were the leaders of the civil, to be fair, they did have a lot of people in the 60s and the 70s leader of the peace movement, the environmental movement, right. the civil rights movement. So just to be fair, to push back a little bit. Well, good point. But yeah. I, I, I was kind of halfway through the point and, okay. and you made the other side of the point. Right. You're right. People have to, people have an obligation, I feel. Each one of us has an obligation to see these things and to do something about them, not just talk about them or wish that they weren't. Um, mm -hmm. When a critical mass in a population um, get, gains control, and a critical mass can be 10% of the population, when a critical mass gains control, the whole population shifts. A bad example is what happened in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. A bad example is, is what's happening here with, the, with the, 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 the haters coming out and the prejudiced people coming out and running the country. This country has been so great. It hasn't been perfect, but our founding fathers set an example for us for justice and for equality. And we've been aspiring to that for, four, for 240 some years, I think 243 years. And we haven't reached it, but mm -hmm. we've been working steadily towards that aspiration. Mm -hmm. Look at the civil rights movement, look at social security. I mean, all the things that we've done, uh, women's right to vote, We've, we've done so much in order to give um, justice and equality. And now we're at a time where so much of that is being taken away. It's not going to last. It's not going to last a very long time because people, I, I think people have more good in them than, than not. Right. So you brought, we, we are touching on the topic of education. Uh, you just brought up uh, some great leaders that you worked with a little bit with Marjorie Stoneman, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas kids. Uh, talk about what you did with them. Uh, and for the people that don't know, uh, I'm sure the majority of the people do know, that was the school in Parkland, Florida, right down the road here, a little ways uh, where they had the uh, kid uh, came in and shot the school up. Um, and they actually uh, were and are still big leaders in the um, gun reform movement. Well, they've done everything for themselves. They, they had mm -hmm. a, 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 an innate knowledge mm -hmm. that was perfect and when i when i started seeing them i i i, I left the business uh, right at that time to work on this uh, on this uh, gun violence as soon okay. as that that happened it was a lucrative business and um what what uh i used to call in the students at first and it didn't take me a few weeks to call in the professors i was the student <laughs> Because all of the experience yeah. that I that I had had throughout my life about how you how you uh, start a movement, how a movement grows, they were doing everything right, 
Unfortunately, a lot of these uh, uh, students have moved on to uh, college, college and yeah. to going on with their lives. And um, I, I think the potential uh, is, has not been realized, but I do think that others have picked it up. And now, again, the most recent movement has been the kids from Europe and, and around this I country so, yeah. um, realizing that our, our in, environment is in danger. And if somebody doesn't stand up, they're going to be wearing gas masks and worse mm -hmm. just to, to breathe the air when they go out of doors. Right. Uh, so to go back to touch on, and then we're going to move on to politics after this question, to touch on the Imadri Stoneman Douglas kids, what were the stories that they told you uh, when you met with some of these kids? Were they all, was it all horror stories? Was it more about policy that they were trying to change when you worked with these students? No, no, that, I, I, I don't know anything special in that regard. I just know okay. that they realized that they had a movement. They realized that you don't take any bullshit from the politicians. You get out and you confront them and you talk to okay. them. They realized that the power of the people would, uh, would be behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, they they just did they just did everything right, right. and and uh, uh, it, it was a combination of all the all, of your all the uh, parts of your question. Right. They were just they were just um, they had a, a great issue, and they were doing something about it. Going back to uh, what I've said a few times, if you see something that's unjust, if you see something that's wrong. Yeah. do something about it. And these kids stood up and they did something about it. And it's still reverberating and the results are not in yet, but there are going to be more results from what they did. It's it's the good confronting and ultimately conquering the evil. Right. So we're going to touch a couple of points on politics now. Uh, Steve, we've seen what's went on in Charlottesville. You watch, and you, uh, as a person that's dealt in, in, in that kind of movement, uh, we've seen Donald Trump say uh, all kinds of different things, racist things, uh, anti-Semitic things, uh, things about dis people with disabilities. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, what is it, uh, what have you seen uh, through people that you know that are conservative? Do they subscribe to the Donald Trump ideology or do they more subscribe to the Republican uh, uh, Republican ideology but more so of the moderate they're not like about his stances yeah. well part of me is tolerant and part of me is intolerant with uh, with the way um, some of our friends and frankly ex-friends uh, think right. um, I think they've got the focus on the wrong ball okay uh, they are thinking of uh, very short-term solutions. Yes. They're thinking of, uh, they, they ignore the evil that's going on. And I'm more worried about them than I am about Trump because there is no Trump without them. True. And there is no Trump without McConnell and the rest of the co-conspirators. Right. Uh, and, and Trump immediately brought people into the White House and just was so frightening immediately that, that uh, Bannon, uh, yes. he was bragging, he is the leader of the alt-right. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe some people didn't know what alt-right meant, but it meant the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi party and the, 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 mm -hmm. the extreme right-wing groups. Mm -hmm. And he brought, that, he brought that man in as his head advisor, probably running the country. And then this Stephen Miller, Yes. So these are these are really evil people because the results of their policies are evil. They don't care about uh, about uh, people's lives, about people's rights, and they just keep on denying them. Mm -hmm. And the people who are letting this go and can't see what's happening scare me. They really mm -hmm. scare me. What do you, what do you say to your friends about Trump that? you try to change, can, can you even change some of these people's minds because they're so set on, Trump could say, and he said this, he could go on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and people wouldn't care. They'd right. just say, okay, that's fine. Well, a lot of them have a known or hidden uh, prejudice, which is one of the things that motivates them. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are motivated by 
what they think Trump's favorability to Israel is, yeah. uh, the the Jewish uh, a lot right. of the Jewish people. But seventy percent of the Jews are against Trump, thirty percent for them, and I think they're operating on on really um, yeah. great information. Tr Trump is a snake oil salesman. Yes. A lot of people have identified that because he's a con artist. There's yeah. nothing more. He'll say whatever it is that you want to hear. He'll promise you everything. And there's no way he's going to deliver it. And he doesn't even yeah. care about these things. He All he right. cares about is his money. own power and his money. Um, I, I wrote an, I write an article for the Palm Beach, uh, for the uh, Sun Sentinel. Sun Sentinel, yeah. Um, every, every two weeks I have a column. And one of my early columns when Trump was, I'd say, just a year in office or less, was we had a hurricane coming. Yeah. And I didn't use Trump's name once in, the, in, in my article, but I wrote about a, the hurricane yeah. and how it destroyed and how greedy it was. And it was, it was apparent from the yeah. beginning. And, um, and uh, people just either didn't see it or didn't want to see it or had <laughs> the, the smaller concerns yeah. that they were focusing on. Now, with all of this said, and I sound tremendously anti-Trump, but I don't hate the guy. I just know him for what he is. Yeah. And I, I feel um, that he's very dangerous. And what yeah. he's just done now with the, uh, with the Kurds, I mean, it's just... Right. total abrogation of any responsibility of any uh, of any common sense of any feelings and people like that um tend to be self-destructive do you get hate mail from uh writing those articles no no i once had something in my mailbox a couple of years ago um it, it looked like a like a kidnap letter whoever <laughs> did, it did this a cut um uh, oh, words, and, words and, oh, yeah. and letters yeah, out letters, of a magazine yeah. and pasted them onto and it said you and your damn friend watson ought to get out of town oh jeez <laughs> well, laughed, laughed, laughed at it and yeah. just try to think who in my community can be such an idiot if you're listening uh raise your hand yeah. come forward and i'll shake your hand <laughs> because that was brilliant all right so a couple more questions on trump why do you think donald trump won the presidency well, I think Hillary Clinton won it. I think she won it by 10 million votes because okay. there were 3 million that we could count. They were from all the dead people. <laughs> but with all of the repre voter repression that went on, un okay. unmitigated, unshameful, unashamed, it, it, was, it was tremendous. Millions of votes got repressed. And then all the cheating and then bring in uh, the FBI guy. Um, Comey, yes. Comey, bring in that uh, that uh, magazine that's on the uh, on the uh, newsstands of every supermarket in the uh, in the country saying... Oh, Star Magazine. No, it was one, one of those. The Inquirer. The Inquirer. Inquirer, yes. And bring, bring that in. And people have... Um, people were told Hillary is running a child pornography uh, ring, yeah, ring in, a, the in pizza. a pizza place. Yeah. Now... I know intelligent people who read that. that. Really? That's where they get the news from, that and Fox News. And it, it, it's, it's surrealistic. It's just beyond yeah. me. But it won't last because it never lasts. The hate never lasts. They, they, they make inroads. And especially in this country, we've always had guardrails up. Now the guardrails are not there. The McConnell, who should be a guardrail, mm -hmm. is, is just a codependent. Right. And and uh, and he's not the only one. There's just so many of them that uh, Barr now is just impossible. He's doing everything that's unpatriotic, and they're 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 taking our constitution and shredding it, and calling themselves patriots. Right. And anybody who who cares about it and reads about it and gets informed about it from just a common sense point of view, not a a partisan point of view, just look what's happening mm -hmm. and these are the people who voted for him and a lot of them are going to vote for him again and these are the people who are the danger and they're always there that 30 percent is always here it's just that every time a, a, a Lindbergh or a george wallace yeah. or somebody's come up in our country to um to to become a dictator uh the the guardrails stop them from doing it and mm -hmm. it was generally their own party right now that party is gone. The right. conservatives with great ideas and 
and, and, and a great balance to, to be heard, um, they're not here anymore, or they're not, they don't have a, a, a platform anymore. They'll be back. To push back, uh, I love you, Steve, but I have to push back a little bit. We, sure. had, to, we had to push back on Dr. Watson, too. Uh, my view, and quite a few people that watch the channel's view, is Hillary Clinton lost because she voted for NAFTA. She supported the crime bill. That people, she screwed Bernie. Uh, people, uh, young people my age were not enthusiastic about her because she screwed Bernie and also because she voted for all these bad deals. She was corrupt, but so was Trump. But Trump was a good con man, as you stated, and he could manipulate the corruption with uh, good media buys and good talk. But Hillary couldn't do that. She just didn't know how. She also made him mistakes. Michigan, she didn't go to until the end. Wisconsin, she never went to. Um, so her campaign was a mess for somebody that ran for the presidency twice uh, and lost the first time to President Obama, the second time to Donald J. Trump. What would you say to people in, in my neck of the woods that say they, fit? and I will come out and say this, I did almost, I thought about voting for Donald Trump because of what he did to, I, I will be, <laughs> uh, be forthright about that. I didn't, I voted for Queen Hillary, unfortunately. Um, but, um, but people like me that were Bernie supporters and still are, and what she did to Bernie was, uh, was disrespectful, illegal in some ways, how she manipulated votes. She had her, her husband went over to New Hampshire on a voting day, and you're not supposed to have somebody five feet away from the polling place. He stopped traffic, people couldn't vote. There was a lot in New York City, where you're from. They did 600 people, 600,000 people were not allowed to vote uh, through the New York Board of Elections, which was full of Clinton surrogates and supporters. So what would you say to people that said, well, let me, let me yeah. say it to you. Go ahead. I'm going to say she won by 20 million votes <laughs> because the mistakes that were made, certainly she owns up to them. Certainly they were, they were made. Uh, part of the what seemed to be a lackadaisical attitude, which I, I don't agree with that, uh, but the election was won. Obama, his biggest mistake was he didn't come out and talk about this when he should have, uh, about what was going on. They knew what was going on from the Russians, and they yeah. didn't come out. They, they didn't want to upset the country. The election was won. Hillary was going to be the uh, president. And they didn't have to. Uh, they didn't have to uh, get get into that. But no, so many mistakes were made. I was very upset. I'm very very strong. She oh. also only had one campaign office in the whole Palm Beach, Miami, Dade, and Broward County. This is the Democratic stronghold. I was talking to a girl at Lynn. Mm -hmm. She said she had to drive down from Boca to Miami. And I said, why are you driving all the way down to Miami? She said, because that's the only Hillary Clinton office that she was she was getting paid to work there. Mm -hmm. That was the only office in this area. I think that's disgraceful. Well, it was more than one, I can assure you. Well, that. I, that's what she, she said. She, I can she, only go she, by. She's wrong. Yeah. But, okay. but, but the, the problem is that that's, or, or the fact is that's part of the problem. I'm not pushing back on you. I'm no, agreeing no, that fair, it was yeah. uh, lax, lackadaisical. That's just another answer to the question that you asked me. Right. And, and it certainly factors in, but um, mm -hmm. I'm more concerned. I think Hillary would have made a really great president. I don't think you, I don't think you believe that. No, but, but she had the okay. experience, <laughs> the contacts, she had uh, the temperament and certainly for what we've got. Yeah, but, but it, we, it, it but would, Steve, we, we can't keep saying be with what we got. We know that he's a con and he's a, he's terrible. He's the worst. But the, I mean, it's terrible when you have to say, Somebody's better than what we got. That's the the two evils. Right, but I'm saying more than Lesser that. I'm evils. saying more than that. I think Hillary would have been a great president, but one never knows. It's only conjecture, and yes. we don't have to deal with that. What we have right. to deal with is getting a, a decent person, a human being, who can uncorrect the corrections that have corrections that have been made uh, back into the, uh, into the white house, get rid of these hate mongers, get rid of these people who don't care about people. You know, there are fundamental things that we have to, we have to prioritize. Yeah. And all of these things that you mentioned to me are kind of some, a lot of them are true, but they're small things. Mm -hmm. You can't equate a, a, uh, a, a, 
uh, uh, what she did on the computer with yeah. the emails yeah. to attacking, uh, allowing the Turks to attack the, uh, the uh, Syria. You, you can't equate these things. You can't equate to destroying all, yeah. the, the, all of the rights that we have that are granted under the Constitution and, and taking them away. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, you have to look at the big, at the big picture and, and you can't demand perfection overnight. We have to work towards perfection. The human experiment is, is only a, a few million years old, a couple of million years old, and we're trying to figure it out. But yeah. when we figure it out where people have a, a quality, where people can realize opportunity, where they can realize their potential, yes. th that's what we have to keep focused on, not where you hold people down and, and, and use them and have total disregard. Because all of us have families, all of us have feelings, all of us want what's better for our children, what's better for ourselves, and what's better for the world. That's mm -hmm. kind of common uh, denominator for, for most people. And when you start destroying that and just, just giving more and more and more to people who don't need more, right. and that's coming from somewhere, the pie is so big and it's being taken away from the poor and ironically and, and crazily, it's being taken away from the middle class because an economy, you, I've traveled all over the world and when I get to a country and I see a weak middle class, I know that country is going nowhere until they get that middle class. The middle class is the market for the rich. Yes. And the rich do better when there's a strong middle class. Right. But they're so myopic, right. they think that they're going to do better when they can just accumulate all that they can. Right. Uh, uh, immediately. Just what's, just what's in front of their nose. And this is how people are thinking today. Going back to something you said about people not having relationships anymore and the kids are on the, yes. on the iPhones these days. The relationship is so, so important. Human beings have to realize that they're not the center, with it. each one of us is not the center of the world. We, right. We're living, we're, we're occupying a, a, a planet with other people and the stronger each person is, the stronger I am. And it's not mm -hmm. just some idealistic concept because if somebody can invent the cure of cancer, rather than picking cotton off a, as a slave and being whipped, that person, the people that have the ability to do that, that are being held down. Yes. And we can't do that. It's what's good for everybody is good, really good for everybody. Well, Larry David, thank you for quoting uh, Bernie <laughs> Sanders in that question. Not me, us is uh, Senator Sanders' slogan in the campaign. Uh, the que my, my little pushback and then the last question, uh, with the Hillary thing was you can't get black people to vote for you when you when your husband supported the crime bill. You can't get uh, a young voters to vote for you when you screw Bernie Sanders, who was, was their leader. Uh, you can't get, and I do agree with you with the votes. We actually talked about this off camera in Michigan. Jill Stein, who Hillary Clinton hates, because uh, she said she stole votes from her, but that's fine. That's a total fabrication. Jill Stein had a, had a case against uh, Donald Trump in court of, uh, for a recount in that election of, about voting, which was what you just stated. And Hillary Clinton was in the uh, litigation, and then she dropped out. So those are three things. And you can't win if you support NAFTA. And Donald Trump is the greatest con man on earth saying that he's going to bring back the jobs. And then he's fighting against somebody that supported NAFTA, supported the crime bill, and is the worst candidate in American history. Well, so the, the one the one thing I can say to you is sure. you have to look at the big picture. Yes. You can't demand perfection when none is she possible. She ran twice though, Steve. Her husband was the president. She was groomed to be a presidential now, I'm candidate. I'm not talking about I'm talking about bigger than Hillary. Okay. I'm talking to you as a friend. That's fine. When when you when you focus on the things that matter little compared to things that matter much. True. You have to look inside yourself and see what's important to you. What are the really important things to you? And the important things, you should look for the candidate, whoever they are, who is going to make those important things happen yes. and, and stop and stop them from not happening and, and, and vote against the person who's going to stop them. So all the things that you're saying, I can't disagree. I don't have to push back with you. 
Right. But you're, I think you're just focusing on the wrong ball. I think that you're seeing That's, things yeah. that are very, very minor compared to the things that major. Focus on the atmosphere. Focus on the water. Yes. Focus on rights. Focus on this great American experiment, which is still in progress, which has to continue along right. the line that these genius fa founding fathers laid out for us. Equality, welcoming yeah. strangers to help build your your your, your right. country justice uh we have a, such a great opportunity and right now it's being diverted into its opposite i think the people of my generation and, and i'll end it with this and i want i got that last question i want to ask um uh, i just fed up with the little change um the neoliberalism by the democratic party and that's why a lot of people in my generation support uh, Senator Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and progressives because they're the ones that are talking for big change. And people have fought and died for these big changes in your generation, before your generation, before that. Uh, and we're ready, we're sick of the incrementalism, and we want big change. And, and we're just fed up with it. Every country in the rest of the civilized world has universal health care. Why do we have to have Obamacare, which was Romney care in Massachusetts? Every civilized country is in the climate agreement in Paris. Now, Trump took us out of that, which is fair. But we, we, there's no big ideas besides two or three candidates on climate change. No big ideas on Medic besides, uh, uh, sorry about that. We're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, Hold on, we're going to pause this for a second before this. <laughs> okay. Steve, I think the, the issue is with people of my generation is that we're, we're sick of the incremental change. We, we've been taught, we, oh, Barack Obama ran as Bernie Sanders did for universal health care. He was going to, uh, you know, lift the oceans and, I mean, uh, downplay i whatever the the analogy was but he was supposed to do all these big things and i know he had a republican obstruction congress for the majority of his term but he do had he did have those two years of a democratic house a democratic senate democratic president and all he got was obamacare which was incremental change now obamacare did benefit me uh and it did benefit a lot of people that i know but it's still incremental change in a sellout to the insurance companies. People my generation are looking for big change. We want somebody we can believe in. Barack Obama came in there and said, change we can believe in. I believed in Barack Obama. I voted for Barack Obama twice. And Barack Obama comes in with very incremental change. So it comes to the point that, Steve, that we're looking for big change. And the only people that are running right now that are talking about big changes is Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And those are the people that are on, on my list to support. Obviously, I support Bernie Sanders over anybody because he's been fighting the fight for 30 years, whether it's been in civil rights, whether it's for Medicare for all, and for the environment. So I trust somebody that's been fighting the fight for 40 years. I don't trust somebody like Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, that are just coming to the fight now. And I will not vote for these people. I don't care. I'm just fed up with the Democratic Party saying, blue no matter who, Donald Trump is a menace, so we got to vote for Joe Biden, who I believe is a Republican light, and, I, I, and I'm Kamala Harris, who is a total joke. Cory Booker, what are they going to do? Trump's going to demolish these people in a debate. The only person that has zero scandals is Bernie Sanders. The only person that's in every poll, 26 out of the past 27 polls against Trump, Bernie Sanders by 12, by 13 points. I don't care if he's 80. I don't care if he's 180. I want to vote for somebody I can believe in that can win, that can gin up the base, that can get these people fighting like oh, Barack Obama built Organizing for America. That was supposed to get all the young people together. He gets in office, doesn't do anything with it. So this is what the people my age are talking about. This is the way we're feeling. We are fed up with the way America has treated us. We are fed up with the incremental change. We're Americans. We want to fight for America and we believe in America, but we believe in America that's going to help us and treat everybody fair and equal, as you said uh, many times in your show. And that's what we want. That's why I trust Bernie Sanders. And that's why I will vote for him and I will stand with him. I will fight for him. And I don't care how old he is. 
What about, um, if you want my 